This is Late Night Help. This is the radio show that cares about the most important part of your life, your health. I'm Mark Allen, and along with the insane Daryl Wayne, we're going to spend the next two hours talking about topics that touch each and every one of us. This last weekend, for example, as we record our show, was Father's Day, and we're going to start off our show right now with a brand new book. It's called Small Fry. It's by Lisa Brennan uh, uh, Jobs, and it's a memoir of Lisa's life with uh, her family. Uh, Her mom is an artist, uh, Chris Ann Brennan, and her father, the co-founder of Apple, Steve Jobs. Lisa, thanks for uh, joining us here on Late Night Out. Thank you for having me. Uh, We have a congratulations not only on the book, but also a new baby, right? Thank you. Yeah, well, newish. He's New- 14 months. All right, so well, that's... Still yeah. Delect- delectably cute. Right. I've got to ask, you know, I, I'm, my father passed away before I had kids. Do you think your your dad would have liked to have been a grandfather? I think so. I mean, if my mother is any indication. Originally, she thought she was a little bit blasé about it. She said, I'm not going to be one of those people who's going to show other people pictures of my grandchild this is when I was pregnant um, when they don't want to see them and then after I had my son she said I I can see their eyes glaze over but I just can't stop <laughs> I know I, I <laughs> so she's, she's totally smitten I think my father I, it is of course sad for me that he isn't around to meet his grandson yeah yeah I, I can would have loved it. I I relate to that too and my father loved girls more than boys. I don't know why, but he he always did. And uh, I have a gra- I I have a granddaughter, and he would have spoiled the hell out of her. You know, right. it just it he would have just had taken so much joy. Absolutely, yeah. it's sad. Um, it is sad. It is sad, and it would have been his but first. Then the thing I didn't quite understand before I had kids was they have these little flashes of their relations. Right, so little little bits of his his face and little expressions like my mother and father and like his other grandparents, and so even if my father isn't around, there's a kind of um, continuous presence that is reassuring and delightful. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I see my dad and my and my granddaughter. I think that's the first time I've said that on the air that I have a granddaughter. She's uh, oh, we have a match. Your son is 14 months. My daughter is, yeah. uh, my granddaughter is uh, nine months. It's perfect. They're both on the uh, East Coast. It's a great thing. Um, it's a great thing. It is a great thing. It's a great match. In uh, no, in uh, Washington, D.C., no. but that's really close, right? It's really pretty close on the train. Yeah, not far at all. I love Brooklyn, by the way. Uh, the book is called Small Fry. Um, it is a delightful read. I can't wait for the movie. It reads more like a novel, Lisa. Did you do that intentionally? Well, I'm a writer, and this is sort of how I write. I felt like I didn't want to tell people how to think. I wanted to bring them into my life. And so while it is the facts of my life, it's certainly more... um, narratively lyrical and also uh, literary than some memoirs are. I think some memoirs tell you what to think, and I didn't like that approach. I I figured it was more about feeling, and it was more about other people feeling as if they were part of my childhood and my life instead of telling them what they should feel. In, okay. in, yeah, in reading the book, it, it comes across, I, I feel your pain. I felt your joy, and I think that is different rather than making a blanket statement. And we should point out that the book is not an expose on on how about your dad. I mean, you do talk about him. You talk about your disappointments. You talk about your successes with your dad. But that's something I think everybody can relate to because... I think it is quite a universal story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do chuckle at the, at the idea that people would pick it up thinking it was a, a book about Steve Jobs and then 
and then find that actually it's a coming of age story about a girl. And also that they would think it was a celebrity memoir and then they would find themselves in the pages and their own childhood and their own um, feelings and conflicts and stories. I, uh, you know, I mean, from, um, you know, boyfriends at 17 and, um, and, 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 you know, we all did things like that. You know, we, we, we went to make out and, and away from our families and they find out, right? And, and, you know, my father, my father would say to me, just be careful. And (laughs) I, I mean, and and you know uh, it's just it is a universal thing it really is and it doesn't matter that that you know your father was an international symbol maybe the closer you get to sort of really exposing thoughts and feelings the more a story becomes universal because we're all somehow similar yeah, there is that even similarity. In the, even in the ways we feel we must be completely unique, we're all similar. And so the more you get particular, and also the more you're willing to, as I think I was, be honest and expose yourself and the things you're ashamed about, that does kind of tap a universal nerve, I think. I, absolutely. I think that the, the fact that, I mean, you literally expose yourself. Uh, uh, you, well, not literally. Well, okay, not literally. There are no pictures in the book other than on the back of the cover, yeah. very pretty uh, headshot. Very tasteful. Yes. Very, very, yes, so everybody I, I is close. I read This Boy's Life, which is a memoir by Tobias Wolf when I was writing it, and he is devious and mischievous and sometimes not law-abiding and does all these sneaky, awful things. And I noticed the more he was that way, the more I loved him. It wasn't like the more perfect he was, the more I cared about him. It was the more he was human, the more I cared about him. And flawed. Right. And I think sometimes people have said <laughs> during this process of publicizing the memoir, like, you know, kind of how could you like this person? They weren't perfect. And isn't that true that we don't, or how could you love this person? They weren't perfect. But isn't that true about life? It's not, it's not that we love perfect people. In fact, quite the opposite. Absolutely. I mean, look at TV. You know, there the, the there are anti heroes that are the heroes of TV shows right now. Uh, 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 oh, that's true. Yeah, uh, Daryl. Well, it's it's like uh, Vince Gilligan said with Breaking Bad. You take these yeah. characters that you like, you make them do awful things, and you still like them. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. Even it, though they've done hideous things. Right, exactly. Like making meth and selling it. They're terrible things. Our guest is... Uh, and to the, be clear, that's not in my book. No, yeah, <laughs> it is not in your book. There is nothing <laughs> bad like that. It's, no meth. It, it, no meth. No meth. Um, <laughs> maybe, and, and in fact, uh, you turned down uh, antidepressants. Well, yes. I mean, I think that... That's interesting. I find different people find different parts of my book interesting, and no one has ever (laughs) mentioned this part. But it's true. After um, my freshman year of college, I was clinically depressed, according to my therapist, and I I think it's really true I was. But part of the depression was just I was telling myself horrible things about myself if I really listened closely, and they were coming, you know, a million times a minute. So I had the time then to fight them, to sort of fight those mean voices, and I I decided to do that instead of take the drugs. Later in my life, when my father was dying, I was very anxious. I found, sort of come home and cry for two hours a day. I didn't know what was happening, and I talked with a therapist at the time, and he said, oh, no, you're not depressed, you're anxious. I was lucky that he understood. And so I did take a a small dose of an anti-anxiety drug, actually, then, and it really helped. Um... I didn't take it for very long, but it really did help, and so I, I did gain an appreciation for these things. Um, but, you know, after after um, my freshman year of college, uh, it didn't feel necessary. It felt like I could I could do a lot of work, and, and in fact, it, it, did, it did work. We talk a lot about alternative health on uh, Late Night Health, and there is a place for pharmaceuticals, but there's also a place for therapy, for meditation, and just getting you know, getting yourself 
together. I have to give you one last takeaway in this segment. We're going to come back in just a couple of moments and continue. Thank you for the information about tomato plants. You told me, you told us in the in the book that your mom, she had a new house, you know, and she planted tomatoes and then neglected them. And they were like the sweetest tomatoes you've ever had. And so I told my wife... There is wa- something about neglect with tomatoes when you don't overwater them and the leaves look kind of like they're they're drooping and dying and the fruit, all of the, the fruit gets, the sugars get concentrated in the fruit that it makes the best fruit. It's not it's not meticulous responsibility that makes a good tomato, apparently. Uh, apparently not, and I turned off the water last night and thanked you last night. I... Man, there's a life parallel there, I'm telling there, you. There is indeed. Uh, Lisa Brennan Jobs is our guest. Uh, Small Fry is the name of the book. We're going to take time out for just a moment or two, and we'll have some more time with Lisa coming up. Join us at LateNightHealth.com. There'll be a link to uh, the book on Amazon and other places that Lisa will tell us about later on. Don't go away. Late Night Health continues. You're listening to Late Night Health with Mark Allen. The show continues in a moment. The latest from the greatest, the best in new music by classic rockers, with your host, the insane Daryl Wayne. This is Alice Cooper, and if Daryl Wayne is insane, what does that make me criminally insane? Stick around to find out. Many of the artist interviews for the latest from the greatest have been captured on audiobook. There is a volume one and volume two. Great information and conversations with people in the industry and people surrounded by the industry and of course the rock stars themselves i'm the reverend al green and you're listening to the insane daryl wayne and i said wayne insane you can find it on amazon or blackstone audio search for the latest from the greatest from daryl wayne d-a-r-r-e-l-l-w-a-y-n-e hello this is weird al yankovic and you're listening to the insane Daryl Wayne, aren't you? <laughs> the show continues in a moment. There's a lot of talk all over the internet about the remarkable benefits of carbon 60, and baby boomers are especially excited about it. Greska's Carbon 60 is the premium Carbon 60, developed by an aerospace and NASA scientist. 95% of Greska's customers report positive results from this Nobel Prize winning technology in just four days. Imagine more energy, better health, and more vitality. It's very bioavailable to quickly mend toxin cripple cells. This is a super powerful antioxidant. Bob Greska is so confident that you'll love his Carbon 60, he wants to send you a bottle at 50% off the regular price to see how life-changing this will be for you. Call 720-600-6040. That's 720-600-6040. Visit c-60.com to learn more. Call 720-600-6040 now or visit c-60.com. 